Oh, hello there, everyone. You are about to watch my uh, Forbidden Door 2024 preview that I recorded on the June 25th edition of the Mr. Warren Hayes Show podcast, uh, which means that uh, there were some matches that had not been announced. Practically, uh, all of the Zero Hour wasn't announced. And uh, I don't think there's much missing, but there are matches that aren't covered because they hadn't been announced at that point. Uh, but nonetheless, the core is there. Uh, it's a pretty good preview. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Uh, let's get to it. We have reached the time of the day to talk about Forbidden Door 2024. Preview it. The big pay-per-view that's happening this upcoming weekend. Uh, if I can get my notes straight here. Uh, happening uh, this this uh, this upcoming weekend at uh, the UBS Arena in Elmont, New York on June 30th. It is the third installment of the big, um, it is the third installment of the big uh, 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 crossover show between AEW and New Japan. And uh, this has not been a great build. And, I, you know, you can't sugarcoat it. You, there, there, there are reasons for it, and the reasons are all bad reasons. <laughs> yeah, none of them are good reasons. Um, but this has been a bad pay per view. But then again, look, it's like I feel like this is the third time this year we've had a, this conversation about an AEW pay per view. Where, where we're sitting down here and we're saying, oh, the build hasn't been great. Since Revolution, okay? Past Revolution, I mean. I don't think anyone argued that Revolution, that people were looking forward to Revolution. But I feel, I feel like we were saying, the Dynasty build, ah, it's kind of bad. The Double or Nothing build, ah, it's kind of bad. The Forbidden Door, ah, it's kind of bad. And I can't sit here and say, doesn't matter if the build is bad because the pay-per-views rule because double or nothing wasn't that great. I, 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 you know, I thought it was one of the weaker AEW pay-per-views. So it's not like, it's not like Dynasty, which turned out to be a tremendous pay-per-view, just a fucking fantastic show with a match, a legendary match on it, on it, on top of it all. Yeah, you know, it's, it's weird. And, 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 and in 2022 and 2023, the anticipation for those two Forbidden Door shows carried so much weight. You know, just carried so much weight, made you excited. And despite, you know, whatever happened within the build itself, look, you remember the first paper, the, the, the first Forbidden Door? You remember all the injuries that just threw all the booking plans out the window? Not all of them. I'm I'm being exa I'm exaggerating, but for a, a lot of matches and some big time matches, I was like, ah, we got to rethink this. And and Tony had, would had, would admit to it after the show. Uh, he, he said, look, there were so much, so many injuries, so many guys getting hurt that we couldn't put on the show that we had all initially envisioned, right? But still, we got a great show, like an arguably great pay-per-view. Inarguably great pay-per-view. Um, last year, the train was on rails. You know, we didn't have people, you know, falling off right and left. There was no injury bug. No, the, the show connected. It happened. It was a good time over in Toronto. This year, I don't know. Doesn't feel like a big crossover show. Doesn't feel special. Doesn't have that sheen over the past two years. Why? Diminishing returns? I absolutely adhere to that. That, I think, is reason, uh, reason number one. Excuse number one. I think this kind of pay-per-view ends up being a, a, a diminishing returns concept where, you know, 
you get the big matches out of the way. You, you, you get the, once you get, you know, Danielson versus Okada, once you get uh, Mox versus whoever the fuck, you know, and Mox has even wrestled a lot in New Japan. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of dream matches that are already kind of, you know, crossed off. They're off the list, you know, um, not that there's, there wouldn't be any others, but, you know, Tanahashi, this is late stage Hiroshi Tanahashi, not necessarily as exciting as he once was. Uh, you know, Tetsuya Naito, Naito is always a guy as popular as he is, you know, is he, is he, is he coming into work or is he going to wrestle with his t-shirt on, you know, that's, these are always the things that you have, that, that you keep in mind, so once you get all these matches out of the way, and you, and you put on crossover matches over, cr throughout the year as well, you know, we already had Sabre versus Danielson too, you know, it's like you're getting these crossovers regardless you're getting these guys working promotions having you know you're having these promotions having working relationships now as it should be as it once were and as it should be the idea of the forbidden door becomes much less you know where wrestling promotions don't work with each other now they kind of do and they kind of do at every at any time of the year they just bring in guys and the sheen of the promotion of, of the, of the pay-per-view is absolutely in an environment of diminishing returns. You know, for 20 years, we talked enough about Vince in the past two decades earlier, but over the past 20 years, we've had very little uh, crossover potential because WWE lived in a silo and did not want to work with anyone else. If they worked with anyone else, it meant that they were eventually going to swallow them up. So there wasn't any, there was that excitement didn't exist. WWE lived in its bubble, and everything else for them didn't exist. Um, when AEW arrived and said, no, we're cracking this wall, we're opening this forbidden door, and we're working with other promotions, it felt fresh for a lot of fans, a lot of new fans, where they were like, holy shit, we're working with, with New Japan. AEW, with some of the best wrestlers in the world, are working with New Japan, which also has some of the best wrestlers in the world. This is just tremendous. And as you do more and more of it, I think you really have to dig up some special stuff, some special matches, otherwise it just becomes diminishing returns um because look this year right look this year for the crossovers what do we got so far we have danielson and and, Sh and shingo takagi which is <laughs> anyway we'll talk about the matches later later right but we got danielson and takagi We've got Orange Cassidy and Zack Sabre Jr., which we've seen before. And we've got John Moxley versus Tetsuya Naito, which again, we've seen before. Danielson and Takagi, we've seen it before, but 14 years ago. That's, that's fine. We're having the rematch to a match that happened 14 years ago. So, you know, we, we, we kind of had the big crossover ones, right? I think that's a reason why it doesn't feel as 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 juicy. And the big New Japan guys, you know, Okada, Osprey, they work for AEW now. You know, so this this idea of having these international superstars coming to work your 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 Forbidden Door show on North American soil is not there because New Japan doesn't have many new international superstars anymore. You've got Tetsuya Naito. He, he's been on the decline. Uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi has been in the, on the decline for a while. And I think everyone's just coming around and acquiescing that, yes, this is the truth. This is, he can, this is no longer the ace of the universe kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I think there's there's a part of that where the stars are here in, you know, Will Ospreay wrestles every week, every other week on Dynamite on Wednesday nights. You know, it's just, it's just something that happens now. 
You, you can absolutely ask the question when you look at the card. You say, "Why aren't there more New Japan guys?" On there? And that's legitimate. Like to the like, it's to the point that you know the main event of the show is for the AEW title. It's not, and it's between two AEW guys. Okay, why aren't we getting more? Like, who would you put in that spot if you want a truly main event? Make it special. Who is the top New Japan star that AEW would would want to have? challenge for their world championship on the show there's no one that's the point but there's not all that many new japan guys on the card yet i heard that the guys aren't getting getting paid more for doing the show and again this is a a rumor something i kind of heard but it also makes sense cuz there's been you know people have been taking salary cuts this happens when um corporations don't rec- don't hit their targets people in Japan people take salary cuts the executives everyone so the talent took cuts maybe they don't want to go you know to North America take the flight book a room, stay around here for a couple of days and fly back and then go on a road to show or hit, you know, get ready for the G1 if they're not getting paid more. Because don't rem- don't forget, this is not exclusively an AEW show. This is a crossover event. This, it, this is billed as AEW in New Japan. There's also talk that there's resentment backstage towards AEW as well. You know that, you know we've seen it spill into, uh, we we've seen it spill onto uh, New Japan Television. You know where, you know Yoda Tsuji has been one of the more vocal guys, and you know. But like I said, you know, in fairness, who are the big stars that you want to send over from New Japan, right? Maybe maybe they don't want. Maybe they're not sending any stars because they don't have any because New Japan is in a bit of a rebuilding phase. And let's be honest, so is All Elite Wrestling that is still reeling from the loss of CM Punk and whatever bullshit happened in 2023 with uh, with MJF and the Brochacho stuff, which I still think has a tremendous impact. So in fairness, maybe both guys are like, we're doing our best here this year with what we got. Now, you know, you know, I have zero excitement for Forbidden Door this year. I'm going to watch it, but because the chances we're going to talk about the card, and I think the card on paper has the potential to blow our minds as it stands right now. I'm pretty sure it's not, we're not done yet. But I have, I don't have excitement. And I thought this would be like unquestionably my favorite annual event especially after last year when I got uh, when I was able to go to Toronto and, and, and see it in person it was so much fun and it was so exciting to see New Japan stars there and it, it, everything was great it was a great show I thought it was going to be one of my favorite my favorite events and this year I'm like okay now if you want to flip this around I was all, you know, as I was looking at the card being put together and I was thinking about the status, especially in New Japan, of who are going to be the next big guys. They're not pushing the, they're not pushing anyone with any true success. Sonata was a complete flop. You know, they're not pushing the young guys. They're, I was expecting, because CMLL was around, because they were doing things with stardom, I was expecting a bigger presence from CMLL and stardom which because as opposed to the diminishing returns thing I was talking about earlier we hadn't really seen 
uh, Much Lucha Libre or Joshi on the show. So I'm like, okay. So maybe everything, the show turns into more of a showcase as opposed to just being crossover matches. Maybe we're going to see some, some showcase matches from Stardom, from CMLL. You know, maybe we'll get, uh, you, you know, maybe we'll get, uh, 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 we'll, we'll have them, we'll have them run their shows. Uh, we'll have them run some matches from these promotions on the show since they don't have exciting new stars, right? Why not push more, push more uh, uh, Forbidden Door into being a a party of pro wrestling? You know, a a a a grab bag of different styles of different people that you may not have ever heard of, may not have ever seen before, but they're about to wow you with with their stuff. You know, you could run a, a, a CMLL Cybernetico, right? You could you could throw in the high speed girls from stardom right and in the two multi-man matches and then you're like holy shit yeah exactly chat like the original all in was supposed to be a tremendous feeling of just a a celebration of pro wrestling but we're not even doing that and ultimately i can't help but feel like this is another symptom of the bigger problem in aew which is that nothing really matters anymore <laughs> like stuff happens stuff happens week in week out and 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 nothing really hap nothing really goes anywhere you know no one moves up no one moves down it's just stuff happening things flatline or you have something really good going and uh and the follow up isn't great I don't think right now, I don't think AEW can do meaningful long-term booking. I don't think it's been able to do that for a bit, which was its trademark, which is wild. That was the trademark of the company. This is the company that gave us Omega and, and Adam Page and the Elite, right? Which was tremendous and 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 hangman's rise to a top guy now i just sit back and i'm like i don't trust them they belt up someone they try to elevate someone and it falls flat look at orange cassidy we all thought that this was orange cassidy's opportunity to break the glass ceiling but you know back to back to the mid card you go sport <laughs> you know i don't trust them and it sucks, you know. It sucks for Swerve, who is in this in this limping moment in AEW's history. His championship reign overall is not going to be uh, is not going to be tremendous or memorable. And we're going to look back on it. We're going to look back on, on, on this moment, and we're going to years from now, and we're going to pull up the numbers, and we're going to be like, look. Everything was on the decline. Attendance was in decline. Ratings were in decline. All the all all the business metrics under Swerves' reign showed that everything was going downwards. And I feel, and I've told you all that I on on the Dynamite review every Thursday that I do. I've been saying over the past couple of weeks where I feel finally like Swerve is biting into this championship. Like he's, I feel like he's <laughs> swerving into becoming the champion into becoming a guy he's starting to feel it you can you can feel it in his swagger in his presence in the way that he conducts himself the way he expresses himself there's it's like a switch went off he's starting to feel like a big guy like a top guy right it's starting to click and 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 trust me everyone needs to chill the hell out when it comes to the ratings right especially the the big ratings number from or the very big low low big <laughs> numbers from last wednesday which i'm not going to talk about we don't do wrestling ratings talk much here on the mr warren hay show we like to talk about attendance and that kind of stuff which i think is a, is an extremely telling and tangible uh um 
very, very tangible uh, uh, business metric as opposed to, to ratings, which is really something that layman's shouldn't be involved in. Um, but, you know, but even on top of that, even though the number was historically low for Dynamite, I'm not making a point to talk about it and dissect it. I, first of all, I don't have the chops to do it. I don't, I like, you know, I don't have the, the years of wrestling analysis and comprehension to break it down and tell you, uh, oh, this is going to be, uh, the, 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 this rating compared to so-and-so. Like, I see, I don't even know how, I don't even know how to properly meme it. That's how bad, I, that's how bad my rating analysis, my ratings analysis is. But one thing that I do know about pro wrestling ratings is that if a number dips dramatically one week, you can scream to the heavens that it's a disaster. You can belly laugh your way to the bank saying AEW is dead. But it's the following week that, that really counts. If it's a trend, it's a problem. I understand that. I understand that perfectly. Numbers dip. Dip dramatically. Don't get me wrong. It's a big fucking dip. But let, let's see what happens next, this coming Wednesday, tomorrow or today, depending on when you're listening to this. Let's see what happens on this Wednesday's Dynamite rating and then we'll see if, if there's truly a problem or not. But right now I think everyone needs to chill out regardless of how, how it's impacting the legacy of Swerve Strickland's first run in AEW. I don't think he's had meaningful championship defenses. I think he's been a solid champion. I think he's been well presented. Uh, I, and like I said, I think he's getting the groove. I think something clicked. I think he got it because he comes across more like a top guy right now than in the entirety of his run so far. And Will, Will's a superstar. But what do you do this this weekend? What do you do at Forbidden Door? Do you belt them up? I don't know if you do. I honestly don't know. Like Will is hot. People love Will. He's great. He feels like a guy. But do you have him go into Wembley as world champion? Is this what we're doing? I don't know if you have him win. In fact, I'm pretty sure he's going to lose against Swerve. And they're going to have him lose via Don Callis family interference. And I know there's a big, big rumor going around that it might be Ricochet that they're bringing in to take out Will. And if they do go down that way, look, unless they pull off some of the coolest interference of all time, it's going to stink and I'm going to hate it. I'm, I, I, I promise you right now, it's going to stink. I'm, I am not going to like it. I am going to come here next week and bury the hell out of the finish if they go in full-on interference because the match is going to be phenomenal. I don't think anyone is arguing. I haven't seen it that... Will Ospreay versus Swerve Strickland is going to stink. Big match Swerve is a thing. We know he can, we know big match Swerve exists. We've seen it with Adam Page. The feud that made Swerve into a top guy. We see, we've seen it. And he's wrestling a friend, a buddy, a chum, a guy he's known for years and gets along well with the guy who he's friends with. And like I said, at the very beginning of the whole thing, when it was announced on the Dynamite review on that Thursday, go and check the tape if you don't believe me. I said, I wouldn't even be surprised if Will lobbies TK to have him lose against Swerve because he wants his buddy to go over. Because he wants his buddy to get a win on him because he knows that'll help his prestige it's all his aura and he won't come across like a transitional champion or a lame duck champion whatever you want to call it 
I wouldn't be, because that's the kind of thing Will Ospreay does. Osprey understands the business. He knows what kind of position he is, he's in. And I'm sure he is part of the crew trying to convince TK that he should lose to Swerve. Convinced. But I think the only way that you reasonably do this not reasonably. No. Will could absolutely, absolutely take a clean L. And he should. Swerve beating Will Ospreay, clean as a sheet, one, two, three, be tremendous. And Will can absolutely take the loss. We don't have to do the interference, but they probably will. Because they're probably setting something up. I don't know about the ricochet stuff. Like, I, I don't know anything. I haven't heard a single fucking thing. Excuse me, Will YouTube algorithm. Please forgive me. I haven't heard, heard a single thing. But we just, look, we just came off a pay-per-view where the majority of the matches all had interference in them. It was exhausting. <laughs> so I'm just thinking about this and then you, and, and, and it's sending shivers up and down my spine so I'm not in a position of confidence here so if, look is Swerve going to hang on to the title in this match yes I do believe he will I do believe he will I don't think you know strapping Will up as an emergency reaction to you know rating slipping or whatever the fuck I don't think that's going to fix the problem because the problems are numerous and they don't exist with who is your champion. The problems are booking, storytelling, and making shit feel significant again, right? Look, again, on my Dynamite review just this past week, I was the guy sitting here saying, give us more cool matches. I love, the, I love cool matches. The multi-man matches... That eight-man all-star match that they had on, on Dynamite last Wednesday, chef's kiss. Tremendous. I was, that's what they should be doing every week. And what did I compound it? Why did I, say, why did I say it was a good idea? Not only because the guys work hard, not only because it's, it, it always turns into a cool match, but because you can set all sorts of little stories in there, things that you can go back on, right? And, and that's where I'm saying... You, it needs to feel significant. That's why you need to do things. Not just throw cool match together, cool matches together. Make these cool matches come together and give direction to stuff. Create stories in those matches. If, if most of our other matches happen and you had stuff happening in there, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be that much of a problem, right? But it's the opposite. It's like most matches happen and there's no story, there's no follow-up, there's no, there's nothing to make you feel like this was a part of something. It's just, now it's just like stuff happening. I'm booking for the sickos. Yeah, well, guess what? The sickos want continuity too. We love ourselves, we love ourselves a Kazuchika Okada versus Ultimo Guerrero. Don't get me wrong. Despite how the match turned out. Like the concept of it, like holy shit, that's fine. But what... It's what comes of it after. And that match in a vacuum would be fine if everything around it in AEW felt significant. We could, we could excuse it. We could be like, all right, this is good. But we're in, a, we're in a position, we're at a spot right now where nothing feels significant. Nothing feels like it matters anymore. So when you do matches that are ostensibly um, throwaway matches like Okada versus Ultimo Guerrero, it's just like, it's one amongst others yes it's a cool match it's a sicko match but the sickles like a little they like a little meat on their bone and i'm definitely not saying here aew needs more stories needs one i think AEW has plenty of those we just need proper follow-ups we need we need we want the long-term vision to return it's not as bad as it was a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, where everything really did feel slapdash and hurried. And I think that the fact that 
AEW is booking two tournaments right now is helping plan the booking over the next couple of weeks because you have to plan tournaments in advance. You have to set up your brackets and like, okay, well, this is my winner. This is how we get there. And then you can't escape it. And oddly enough, that's when AEW shines. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy the, the cool matches, but we get behind wrestlers and the follow-ups suck. And that just, it takes the wind out of your sail, man. And I know AEW is in a spot they're, they're, where they're trying to build new people. Not unlike we were talking about with, um, um, with New Japan. And I'm going to give, I, I will continue to give credit to AEW for trying new things. For trying stuff out for putting Swerve at the top. A guy who I've always envisioned as a top, uh, as a world champion, as a top guy, and he is now. But it takes balls to do it. It takes it, 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 it you you need some 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 gumption to be like, "Yeah, we're pulling the trigger on this." Cuz you could waffle on it for so long. So I give them credit and they're building up. I feel like there's something simmering, right? They're trying new stuff out with Swerve and Osprey. They're fleshing out the women. I don't think the women's division, here's something you're not hearing a lot of talk about, but I think the women's division hasn't been this good in a long fucking time. Excuse me again, algorithm. But it has not been as good as it has been as, as it is right now. With Mercedes in here, with Tony finally finding balance between the timeless Tony stuff and Tony Storm, the the excellent pro wrestler, Mariah May, Mar uh, Statlander. Statlander is she is on the cusp of being huge. Willow is not in the. She is one of the best assets this company has. And then they're bringing in Mina Shirakawa to add in some flair into this to give it a little pizzazz. This is something. And then your undercard, like the the like the 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 foundations of this women's division, you've got you've got Anna J and Julia Hart, who are women that everyone agrees have been good bets. Great hedged bets by Tony Khan and these women have been paying dividends and they are only getting better. And Sky Blue, I think, after a very weird 2023, I think she's found her footing. Miss Hardcore. Throw in Deanna Perazzo in there if you want. Throw in Serena Deeb in there if you want. Thunder Rose is there. And then there's the missing elements on top of it. Jamie Hayter, Britt Baker. The women's division in AEW has never been this solid. And we're trying stuff out. This only comes with experimentation. Putting stuff out there, seeing what's happening. We're getting a feud, a, a personal blood feud that doesn't involve a title in AEW, in the women's division, between Chris and Willow. Tremendous. So we're, I, I, I can also appreciate that AEW is, re, is in a rebuilding mode and has been in a rebuilding mode since the CM Punk disaster. But we've got to reach a point and I think we're, we've reached that point where we cannot sit on this, on this excuse and say, well, you know, CM Punk really took all and all the, the ensuing drama and the legal issues really took the wind out of our cell. Like at some point, look, you showed the footage. We're all, we're, excuse me, 
We're all over it. We're all over it. Hopefully you are too. They're trying things. They just need to get hot. And New Japan, like I said earlier, is doing the same thing here. But the difference here, here's the difference between New Japan and AEW. New Japan last week released the, 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 the field for the G1 Climax this year. And they are putting their money where their mouth is. And we're going to talk about the play-ins a little later in the show. Um, they put their money where their mouth is. They're putting over the new guys. They're putting the new guys into the positions of, of a, a, where it's time for them to shine. They're taking out the old guard. They're taking out people who have been systematically in G1s for like 17 years or whatever. And they're putting the new guys in. It's like, okay, time for y'all to make their spots, which is something Hiroshi Tanahashi told us he was going to do when he presented his 10-point plan. And everyone was like, okay, talk is cheap. Well, there you go. Now he's acting on it. Like I can point to New Japan with that with with the composition of this year's G1 and say, okay, uh, they are trying something different. They are trying to build new guys. You can see it. And I hope I can do that with AEW too. I hope I can turn around to AEW. And say, okay, I see what you're doing. I see it. But right now, I have no faith in the long-term booking. I have no faith in long-term stories. And listen, all of this discourse, all of this preamble to this preview for a card that I think is actually very good. <laughs> this is the silly part of it, right? It's the most silly part of it. And I'm glad, chat, you're enjoying, you're enjoying the talk at the same time. Uh, and that we, we we're finding some common ground on the women's division at the same time. Um, that all makes me happy. But let's get into the the the, the show itself. Um, what do we got? We got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got eight matches announced for the, uh, when I'm recording this. Right? There will be more. You know, we know there's more guys in town. Like, f yeah, they announced today on Dynamite tomorrow, or at least on Wednesday, whenever you're listening to this, there we're getting uh, the Blackpool Combat Club versus Los Ingobernables Ingobernable de Japón. We're getting, we're getting uh, uh, Mox, Claudio, and Wheeler Yuta versus Shingo Takagi, Hiromu Takahashi, and Titan. On fucking AEW TV on a Wednesday night. I couldn't be more... I, first of all, I couldn't be more excited for that match. That is completely my speed. But look, there's there's guys in town. There's guys in town. So there's going to be more matches that are going to be add, added here, right? And there's no matches announced for the the zero hour yet. The, I, I would say it's a safe guess. It's a safe bet to say that there will be two more matches added to the card, right? I think so. Uh, I'm terrified that we're going to get the Bucks versus the Acclaimed on this show. That, to me, it screams dynamite, not pay-per-view. But then again, I, I know I'm one of the... And I've been, a I've been out on the Acclaimed longer than most of you. It has never been for me. Um... And especially now at, at this stage where I feel like they, they need to tone this down, right? They, I, 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 look, there's to me, there's nothing good out of this. Um, didn't Jeff Cobb say that he was going to challenge someone? I feel like he had said that because he's the New Japan World Television Champion, right? And I feel like in a post-match interview after a New Japan show, he said, yeah, anyone in AEW Forbidden Door, I'm coming, you know, it's... So why isn't he? Why isn't he been announced? And it better not be like you know, Lance Archer again. You know, give us something with some meat on the bones, because Jeff Cobb's got a lot of that. Um, but I, I feel like he was supposed to be on the show. Uh, 
And look, you know, Hiromu's in town. You know, are we ever going to get are we ever going to get Hiromu versus Darby Allen? I, I feel like the stars are never aligned for that to happen. Anyway, let's go down the the card here. Let's take a look at what we do know is coming. Hechicero is going to take on MJF. I mean, cool. Like, I mean, when you talk about a random, you know, fire pro wrestling, you know, randomizer match, this is it. <laughs> this is a perfect example. You're like Hechicero versus MJF. Cool, but also kind of out of left field. And, you know, Hechicero is not like uh, the biggest CMLL star. Right? He's not the biggest guy, but um, but he's a guy that North Americans adore. He's he's the Tomohiro Ishii of CMLL, where he's bigger everywhere else he goes than in his own hometown slash country. You know, not that he's not over in 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 Japan, Tomohiro Ishii is, but when he comes here, when he goes to 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 the UK, uh, it's just you know he's umpteen times bigger um i mean look I, I, I honestly don't know what to expect out of this how is mjf gonna handle hechicero who's you know he's a he's a bit of a worker himself you know i don't know owen hart foundation 2024 tournament quarter men's tournament i should say quarter final match brian danielson will be taking on shingo takagi this is my most anticipated match of the entire show. This has the potential to be match of the night and just like eclipse everything. I mentioned it earlier, 14 years ago, Danielson, you remember when Danielson had been fired uh, from WWE when he choked out uh, Justin Roberts with a tie, remember that? And they they, they told, told him to hit the bricks. Um, he went back, he hit the indies and he did a, Dragon Gate USA match against Shingo it, it, in 2010 at the end of the Dragon Show in Philadelphia. And this was the only time they've ever encountered each, each other since. So the bar is tremendous. Like if you have not seen this match, I shared it in the Mr. Warren Hayes Show Discord. Come join us. Link is in the description. I, you know, I share cool retro matches once in a while. Like this one here, I you know I was able to put it up there. What an absolutely! This is an absolutely fantastic match. The one they had in 2010, absolutely tremendous. The bar is so incredibly high, and they are so much better and seasoned and smarter. Like they're so good at what they do now. They're they're they're, they're near untouchable. 14 years later. And this match is going to rule. I am excited. I can't wait to see it. And Danielson wins. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, I think Shingo's going to hit the bricks and go get ready for the G1. Uh, Orange Cassidy versus Zack Sabre Jr. I mean, fun match, but we've seen this. You know, this is kind of what I mean. Like, it's, it's, it's a, I, I, I'm going to enjoy this match. Don't get me wrong. I'm excited to see it. And they had some nice exchanges on Dynamite, you know, in the in, in the eight-man all-star match. But we've seen this match. But these are two good wrestlers. Zack Sabre Jr. is a great wrestler. Zach, Orange Cassidy is very good. I think Zack wins. I think Zach, Here's... You want a hot take? If Zack Sabre Jr. wins this match, he's winning the G1. How about that? Because, I don't want to get off track here, but I think it is Zack Sabre Jr.'s G1 to win this year. I think it makes too much sense. And I think that if he live, le let's revisit this. Let's make a note of this. If Zack Sabre Jr. defeats Orin Cassidy at Forbidden Door, I predict he wins the G1. AEW World Women's World Championship. Tony Storm will be defending against Mina Shirakawa. This is another match that has the potential to be very good. I, Tony and Mina, stardom bred. Tony's fantastic. Mina's great. Like, there's just too much talent in this ring. The only thing, 
that can keep this match from hitting the heights is the Mariah nonsense. If we have more lesbian love triangle going on, you know, if there's too much of that, it's going to distract from the match. And that is always the problem with Tony Storm matches since the timeless gimmick started. How much stick do we rely on before we actually get a super fun match? Because Tony's able. Tony is capable. She is one of the best wrestlers, best women in, in North America. Bar none. Hopefully, Mina and her little stardom vibes will be able to drag the best out of uh, out of Tony Storm here. Hopefully. But eh, keep your eyes peeled on this uh, Mariah May stuff, right? AWTNT ladder match. We, for now, we have Mark Briscoe, Kaneske Takeshita, Jack Perry, Dante Martin, and Leo Rush confirmed. I think we have one more entrant left. Um... I, I think so, right? I don't think anyone's been announced. I don't think, I don't even, I don't even think there's a match for that that's been announced for, unless for 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 Dynamite. I don't think it's been announced unless it's happening as we're recording this. But, you know, obviously I don't know because I'm not on. You know, I don't follow the Twitter stuff, but especially when I'm when I'm recording. So, um, personally, look, I am thrilled to see Leo Rush in here, and if. Uh, if this is a make do for Leo Rush, and you know, Leo Rush is one of these guys where he look, he is so talented and he has got so much to give. And I've been a Leo Rush cheerleader for years. I, I I've been I've been pushing for this guy for years. And if he can get out of his own way and put together whatever needs to be put together so he so he can stay in a fucking company. Excuse me, algorithm again. But if he can do that. Um, that would be tremendous. I would love that. I would absolutely love that. Then we have the uh, match for the AEW TBS Championship and the New Japan Strong Women's Championship. Mercedes Monet versus Stephanie Vacare. It's a winner-take-all match. We are getting a dual champion at the end of this. Um... This is also another match that risks falling into greatness territory. Monet is going to, I think Monet is going to end this match walking around with two titles. She is finally going to carry the title that was designed for her. <laughs> She's going to walk around with that belt. And I think that's fine. And Stephanie Vacare, Stephanie Vacare to me is really the story of the match here. Because I think... She has, uh, I think she has something to prove. I think she has something to prove. Uh, she, um, she wants to get to, she, she, let me start over. Last year, when they had the 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 strong women's turn was it last year or was it the year before uh, i already i think it was last year right it was last year when they had the the i think or was it the year before i'm oh, forgive forgive me in my 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 poor appreciation for timelines um so um so listen we've got um We've got uh, 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 Vacare. When she wrestled there, most American fans had no idea who she was. She got into her her knockout round match against Mercedes Monet and lost. Right, she was straight out of the tournament on her first match. But that match woke up a lot of people to take notice. Me, like, who is she? And we've talked about it here. So the rub that she got from that Mercedes Monet match is still carrying today that match made brand new Stephanie Vacare fans now she's coming into this match and arguably the biggest audience in front of the biggest audience that she's wrestled in that she's wrestled for in the United States 
she's got cameras and attention all over her. She's coming in with something to prove. She wants, she, and she's probably losing, but I think this she's in a position where she can lose up. She already lo lost up in the strong tournament. I think she can do it again, especially since she's wrestling Mercedes, which they clearly have good, great chemistry. They clearly do. If you base yourself on the on the tournament, um, I think this match has the potential to be great. I think this is going to be tremendous. I think she, she, she I think she's going to lose Vicaris, but I think she's going to come out a winner nonetheless. I'm excited to see this match. John Moxley will be defending the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship against Tetsuya Naito. Of course, I think. Naito's winning. I think that's the I think that's the safe bet. Getting his win back from Moxley, uh, ending the um, the heartache with uh, New Japan fans who just could not stand that an AEW guy had the title. Uh, probably being brings some peace also back to the locker room. Maybe feeling over in Japan. Maybe not feeling as much as uh, that. Not maybe to sort of help curb the the feeling that uh, uh, New Japan is AEW's developmental arm, you know, that it's the little brother in the relationship, all that stuff. I, I think um, I think we're on our way to that. I, you know, I like their match at Windy City Riot, Mox and, and Naito, and I think they might have a better one in them, and I think this is, this is the perfect time to do it. And like I said, uh, Naito gets his win back, gets the belt back, we got a proper self-contained G1 with Tetsuya Naito, who will quite assuredly be back headlining the Tokyo Dome uh, in January. All the question is against who at this point. Uh, I know he hit social media or whatever, or did an interview, and, and he said that he will, if he loses against John Moxley, he will give up his spot in the G1. And a lot of people went, ooh. But there's no way Tony Khan is letting John Moxley leave for the summer in 2024. Hell no. No. There's no way. Mox is absolutely dropping the title. This sh I'm excited. This should be very good. And then the AEW world title match, Swerve Strickland versus Will Ospreay. We already talked about this, but this should also be great. You see what I mean? I... I don't know how long I spent talking, you know, giving you discourse around how much I feel like Forbidden Door is not a good build and a bit of a, a, a letdown in that aspect. But then I run down the card. I'm like, Jesus Christ, on paper, this stuff, this mat, this, excuse me, this card is actually excellent. On paper, this should be as the kids like to overuse, a banger. I'm excited for it. I mean, well, listen. I'm excited for the matches, but the pay-per-view I'm not excited for. Does that make sense? Like, there's nothing that gets me excited for the pay-per-view, but I'm excited for the matches. Does that make sense? I, it does. It sounds like something a crazy person would say. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, next week uh, on the podcast, of course, we're going to be reviewing Forbidden Door 2024 this Sunday. I'll be watching. I will be watching, AEW. You're warned. 